To understand the full extent of Polynesian culture, we need to travel north to the islands of Hawaii. Many of Hawaii's early inhabitants had come from Raiatea, settling here around 400 AD. But gradually, they developed a culture of their own. Hawaii was, in many respects, even more advanced than the islands around Tahiti. And the proof of that is beneath my feet. I'm walking along a one mile long wall that marks out the edge of a large man-made reservoir. It was originally used by indigenous Hawaiians to trap, cultivate and catch fish. It was, in other words, a fish farm. And astonishingly, completely astonishingly, it was originally built as much as 800 years ago. There was nothing like it anywhere else in the world at the time. And although it may not look like it today, this was once world-leading technology. Hawaiian society was as complex as its engineering projects. Communities were highly stratified, run by hereditary chiefs known as ali'i. This hierarchical society produced a singular art form. It began in a place like this. Teams of men roaming the forests with nets in hand. They were under orders from their chiefs to look for something precious. They were hunting for a handful of birds that were native to the Hawaiian islands. Now, one of them was the i'ivi, the scarlet honey creeper. The other one was the o'o, the honey eater. Now, what they would do in the case of the o'o, for instance, was to cover a branch with glue, wait for it to land and get stuck, and then very, very carefully remove just the tiny number of yellow feathers from its body. And then if they didn't eat it, they would release it back into the wild. Now, over time, they would trap hundreds and hundreds of birds and collect thousands and thousands of feathers. And then they would do something remarkable with them. These unforgettable faces belong to Kuka Ilimoku, the land snatcher, the island eater, the Hawaiian god of war. They are at least 250 years old, perhaps much more, and they've both been made in the same way. An armature has been fashioned from wicker and then covered with fibre netting, and you can just see the fibre netting down here. Then, in valuable feathers, tens of thousands of them have been tied bundle by bundle onto the netting. The eyes are mother of pearl shells. The teeth have been extracted from the mouths of some very unfortunate dogs. And this head is covered with human hair that once belonged either to a dead ancestor or to the chief who commissioned it. All of the materials are symbolic in one way or another, but none more so than the feathers. The Hawaiians believed that the gods were born covered head to toe in feathers and that like birds they could move effortlessly from earth up to heaven. But they are terrifying. Their goggle eyes stare out at us, their mouths grimace, but they were supposed to be unpleasant. Heads like these, which are known as akua hulumanu, serve many different functions, but arguably their most important job occurred on the battlefield. When Hawaiian men went into battle, they held these war gods above them on a pole in order to intimidate their enemies. And the scarier their head was, the more likely they were to gain a psychological and indeed spiritual advantage. Featherwork had many applications, and today indigenous Hawaiians are still using this old technique. Feather work has been a part of Hawaii's culture, is a part of our history from the very beginning. As our ancestors traveled throughout the Pacific and they inhabited islands, it came with them. 
And when they landed here in Hawaii and adapted to the surroundings that we have and the birds that we have, they refined their work and there is nowhere else that you will find this type of intricate featherwork. Aloha mai kākou o Regina Mele Kahale Punachan Ko'u Inoa. Ke noho nei au ma kaimuki. I've been around feathers all my life and my tutu started teaching me when I was five years old. Of course in the beginning I didn't want to but uh, eventually I knew that it was my kuleana, it was my responsibility. And so now that my tutu and my mother have passed, um, I continue their work. Feather work, when we look back in our history, was very important, very symbolic. Feather work was only worn by our ali'i, or our kahuna class. The ali'i were our rulers, our chiefs, our chiefesses. The kahuna were the religious folk, our scholars and teachers. Some feathers in particular, like the yellow, coming from the o'o or the mamo, were very few in number. So typically, if you saw feather articles like capes or lei, that had those feathers, typically those articles belong to those of a higher rank. So someone like Kamehameha, our first king, his cloak was entirely yellow. Stories say that it took as much as 10 generations just to collect enough feathers to be able to produce this cloak. The Bishop Museum in Honolulu houses a centuries-old feathered cape that is particularly special. It contains an estimated half a million feathers extracted from 80 to 90,000 birds and would have taken years to make. It is one of the masterpieces of Hawaiian featherwork. At the end of the 18th century, it was presented to someone the Hawaiians must have regarded as a great leader not a local chief, but a British mariner called James Cook, whose arrival in Polynesia would change everything. When Cook and the crew of the Endeavour first entered the Pacific in 1769, the South Seas were largely unknown to Europeans. Cook's voyage was shaped by the values of the Enlightenment. On board the Endeavour were scientists and artists to record not only the flora and fauna, but the culture of the last unknown corner of the world. 